if I draw a healthy boundary and I fear this other person is gonna walk away from me, abandon me, discredit me, no longer support me, whatever it is, then eventually that person's gonna abandon me, discredit me, whatever, because healthy people respond to healthy boundaries in a good way. It's unhealthy people that have never met a boundary that they really like. Welcome to the Holy Mess Podcast. We're Joy and Becca, and we share the things of life through a lens of faith, and we find the hope in all of it. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, author Lisa Turkhurst. You may have seen her speak before or picked up one of her Bible studies, but her newest book is called Good Boundaries and Goodbyes. It doesn't officially come out for another week, but you can pre-order it right now. Lisa has walked a very difficult road publicly, and she shares what she's learned in this new book about how to love others without losing the best of who you are. And if you've ever struggled with boundaries, Becca and I talk about how we have so much. We're going to cover how to have that initial conversation about boundaries with someone, what to do when someone continually crosses yours, and how you end up figuring out if it's time to say goodbye or not. You're in for a treat. Not only is she hilarious, with a story at the end about a colonoscopy that you do not want to miss. But Lisa shares so much wisdom with us. First, Lisa, I'm hoping that you can give us just a quick overview of your story and what led to this book. Yeah. So um, I think most people who have been following along with my story know that I'd experienced um, a lot of marital heartbreak and it lasted a long time. Um, You know, I was very determined to really fight for my marriage. And I'm sure there were some noble reasons for that and holy reasons. There were probably some unhealthy reasons for that. Um, But through it all, I realized where there's chaos, there's a lack of boundaries. And so that was something I needed to tend to. And especially when you have done everything you can do and you realize the relationship is unsustainable, unhealthy, and um, and just it's not going to move on. That was so hard for me to accept. So um, yeah, my, in, my marriage ended um, in divorce, but I like to say that it's the, it was the death of a marriage because that I feel like that's so much more appropriate. And so there was a lot of grief but also a lot of healing. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. We're so grateful that you would talk about this because oftentimes people say that boundaries are not biblical, but I'm thankful that you would say, no, actually lack of boundaries are not biblical. I don't know about you, but I was raised with some unhealthy things, like the thought that we're responsible for other people's feelings when we're not. So Were you raised with an idea of boundaries, and when did you recognize that they are actually healthy? I had no idea about boundaries, and then I also kind of felt it was unkind and unchristian. By the time I got into the church and was walking with Jesus, I really felt it was unkind and unchristian to draw boundaries, and mainly I didn't think boundaries really worked anyway. So what's interesting is at the beginning of this book, it started with a big question, are boundaries biblical? Because I feel like a lot of the reasons why our boundaries fall apart in important relationships is because we don't have the emotional fortitude or the biblical confidence to understand that boundaries are not just a good idea. They're actually God's idea. And if we look in the Bible right from Genesis 1, God established the foundations of the world using boundaries. You know, he separated the light from the darkness. He separated the sky from the water. He separated the land from the sea. And so those are all examples of boundaries. And then when we get into Genesis 2, this is what was most fascinating to me. Think of what topic God could have chosen. So many topics for the very first recorded conversation with man, and he chose the topic of a boundary. And I find that fascinating. In Genesis 2, God tells Adam, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, which shows us that boundaries are for the sake of freedom. When we know where the boundary lines are, we know where the real freedom is. So God says, you are free to eat from any tree. So it's not overly restrictive. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, just not this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat from it, you will die. So God said, 
I'm going to give you access to the garden. I expect you to be responsible. Just don't eat from this one tree. And there was a consequence, which is if you eat from that tree, you will die. And that wasn't so God could be a killjoy God. That was to be protective because now we are living with that heavy weight of the knowledge of evil. If you turn on the TV and there's another school shooting, that sinking feeling that we have, it's not supposed to be this way. Or, you know, we hear of a friend getting cancer or, you know, we suffer through some kind of abuse or abandonment. That's the heavy weight of the knowledge of evil that God was trying to protect us from. So even from the very beginning, we not only see God establishing boundaries, but in the context of relational health, God has this beautiful conversation that can be modeled when we establish boundaries. And we see humans screw it up, and then God has to establish the boundary. And we want to see human examples of this, but I think we don't often because it was painful when God did it, and it's painful when we try to do it. And one of the words that you mentioned was access. And that was one thing I really found interesting because you mentioned how some people will abuse your access. And I think especially in Christian circles— We define abuse as, you know, the big things that are kind of obvious, but I'm hoping you can kind of walk us through what it looks like when someone abuses our access and when we need to set boundaries because of that. I think it's important to note this isn't just for the more extreme situations um, of abuse. You know, we're all on a spectrum in our relationship. It's normal to have difficulties. It's toxic to be in a destructive relationship. So there's a big spectrum there, but boundaries are for both ends of the spectrum and hopefully to bring us back to the middle called healthy. And so as I continued to study, are boundaries biblical? Where do we see God establishing the boundaries? Another place that I found super fascinating in the Bible was when God established the tabernacle, which eventually became the temple. And if you look at God's instructions for the temple, he allowed certain people access that other people weren't granted. This didn't mean one group of people was more valuable than the other. It meant that they had to carry a different level of responsibility. So the more access someone got, the more responsibility they were required to demonstrate. By the time you get all the way to the Holy of Holies, there was only one that was given that full access, and that was the high priest once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people. And he had to be absolutely purified and absolutely cleansed. Those were his responsibilities in order to go into the Holy of Holies, or he would drop dead. And so when I think about that high level of access, it required the highest level of responsibility and also carried the highest consequence. And when I started to think about how does this apply to my life, those three words became really important. Access, responsibility, consequence. To the level that we give someone access to us, and that can be emotionally, financially, spiritually, relationally, Um, To the level that we give them access is to the level that we need to require them to be responsible with that access. Where the tension usually comes in is I was giving level 10 access to people who maybe were only demonstrating level 3 responsibility. So the mistake that I made for so long is I wanted them to lift up their access, and certainly you can have a conversation with them, and that is healthy to have a conversation But if they are unwilling or incapable of anything more than a level three access, then the mistake I made was I kept trying to put a boundary on them to force them to be more responsible. Mm -hmm. And that never works because you cannot put a boundary on someone else and expect if they are unwilling or incapable, those changes may be temporary, may, may be temporary behavior modification but it's not going to be lasting change. So the only thing that you can do that's really lasting, sustainable, and healthy is to put a boundary in that dynamic around yourself. And you choose to reduce the level of access you grant down to the level of responsibility they demonstrate. Okay, so where does the consequence come into play then with what you explained? Okay, well, the consequence is twofold. You know, we do have to establish our boundaries and establish a consequence. Boundaries are never for the sake of punishing someone or controlling someone or manipulating someone. So the the consequence is, if you do this, then I will respond in this way. If you bring up a politically charged conversation at the Thanksgiving table, I will not try to control you, 
but I will step away from the table until that part of the conversation is over. Is that almost tied to your access to, because you're saying you don't get access to me in this conversation? Exactly. And I'm not going to grant you access to my thoughts and opinions because I don't feel safe, or I just don't I don't have it to give to bring up that charged of a conversation at Thanksgiving. So there's a consequence there in in the boundary, but there's two different things of consequences that you have to think through. The other consequence really is what will this cost me if I establish the boundary? You know, I used to think I struggled with people pleasing and that's why I struggled with boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, so I did struggle with people pleasing and I thought it was for the, I was just always trying to keep someone else happy. But when I really poked at this, I was people pleasing, trying to keep someone else happy, not because I wanted them to be happy, but I wanted them to be happy so that they would not take from me what they were giving me that I felt I would not be okay if they took that away. That is some therapy work right there. Because I think a a lot of us don't dig that deep. So it's proof you've done work and we're grateful because a lot of us are there. And a lot of us walking on eggshells and not making that connection that it's protecting our peace. Right. But we also have to assess, is the pain of dealing with this relational consequences and not having boundaries, has that pain become so great that we are willing to risk the potential of them taking away what they're providing. And I got to the point where I started to realize the pain of not having boundaries was more painful than the pain of risking what it may cost me if they walk away from me. And really the point I got to is if that other person, if I'm afraid, if I draw a healthy boundary and I fear this other person is going to walk away from me, abandon me, discredit me, no longer support me, whatever it is, then eventually that person's going to abandon me, discredit me, whatever, because healthy people respond to healthy boundaries in a good way. It's unhealthy people that have never met a boundary that they really like. It's so good. And I think one of the areas that a lot of us struggle with when it comes to boundaries is we set a boundary, someone abuses it, and we do the consequence and do that over and over again, but they continue to abuse the boundary. But there's the level of relationship there that we don't want to just step away. So I'm hoping you can maybe give some encouragement for someone who has been setting a boundary, it continues to be abused, and they are just left heartbroken in a relationship. Absolutely. So if we go back to the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, we find that there was one rule. There was one boundary given. In Genesis 3, that boundary was violated by Adam and Eve. And by the time we get to the law and the prophets, sin was just increasing. So there was the need for more and more boundaries. And in the law and the prophets, we find that God had established over 600 boundaries, right? And so biblically speaking, if boundaries continue to be crossed, then maybe there needs to be more boundaries. And if you think about it in terms of the access, you know, if they start reducing their level of responsibility by crossing those boundaries, then we need to reduce the access to keep it in tandem with the responsibilities they're demonstrating. And this is painful and it is hard. And, you know, I think sometimes we have these verses that pop in our mind, like, well, Jesus laid down his life for his friends, and he told us, lay down, you know, it's it's noble to lay down your life for your friends, right? Yes, and I love that you have a section in the book on this, not dispelling Bible verses, but dispelling how people will misinterpret them and even weaponize them. Yeah, and the misunderstandings around Bible verses. So here's the deal. Jesus did lay down his life, but it was for a high and holy purpose, not to enable bad behavior to continue. Mm -hmm. So we must not confuse the good command to love with the bad behavior of enabling. And that's something that we need to remember. And also love should be what draws us together, not what tears us apart. Mm -hmm. So that's why the premise of good boundaries and goodbyes, the whole book is built around loving others well. The subtitle is loving others without losing the best of who we are. Can you back up and help us with the basics? So this is before you know if a boundary will even lead to a goodbye. Say you're trying to set one and I'm confused. Do you sit that other person down and say, 
I've set this boundary and this is the consequence if you cross it? Or do you wait until they cross it and then you let them know about the boundary and the consequence? Because when we're first starting this out, I don't know how to engage that conversation. Well, first of all, I think we don't want to set that other person up to suddenly become super defensive. Mm -hmm. And so um, let me give you an example. Okay. Let's say you and I are best friends. Okay. So we are just we are thick as thieves. We are best buddies. And we love to go to events together. We love to go to conferences together. Um, I love it and you love it. Lately, there's been some tension around us attending conferences together. The, the tension is starting to build with me, though, because you and I have a different definition of being on time. Oh, and you're always waiting for me. So, this just became real to my life. <laughs> oh, no. Enjoy well, have a talk. it's happening. The thing is, if we ride together, that's where the real tension happens. Because my definition of being on time is that I want to get there 20 minutes early. I want to go to the bathroom, get something to drink, and I want to be there when the slides pop up, announcing things before the first praise song ever starts, right? Wow. Your definition of being on time and it doesn't make you a bad person at all. You're just more creative. So as long as we're there by pretty much like the last praise song yeah. before the speaker starts, then <laughs> you are fine. That's, that's on time to you. Yeah. And so I'm going to have a conversation with you about this, and this is how it would go. I love going to conferences with you. I think it's amazing. And don't say but, because if you say but, it negates everything before it. Okay, so remember that. These tips. <laughs> and, and there's been some tension in my heart lately, and I want to own that I have an issue. And my issue is if I cannot get to the conference before everything starts, I can't settle down and enjoy the conference. And you like to be more creative with your time. That doesn't make you bad and me good. That doesn't make me bad and you good. It just means we're different. So... Here is what I need and the boundary that I'm going to put on myself. I'm going to drive myself to the event. And if you want to be early 20 minutes, you can ride with me. That's great. If not, then I will go to the conference myself. I will sit where I want us to sit. I'll save you a seat right? I'll even go get you something to drink and I'll have it waiting for you. And whenever you want to come in, that will be fine. And we'll enjoy the conference together. So some of the consequences are just natural. They're it's just natural. Gone. And it doesn't have to be this hard and horrific, awful thing. Now, I know a lot of relational difficulties are much more difficult. That's why I, throughout the book, Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, I give people scripts to get them started in how to frame their conversation, what to say, what not to say, and literally word-for-word -word scripts that you can follow in difficult situations. That is so helpful because I think I've been doing this wrong for a long time. I've been setting the boundary on the other person instead of setting it on myself and saying, no, I'm going to make changes, and then those are going to affect you. That's right, because I don't want to threaten you. If you don't start getting to my house 20 minutes early, I will leave you. That's, I think, the way that sometimes I'm tempted to do a boundary because that's, I want— That's how we talk to our kids right? sometimes. But if it's our spouses, <laughs> it's not Well, good. I mean, with kids, you know, I mean— I will leave you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we're pulling out of the driveway, whether you're dressed or not. I've done that before. <laughs> so um, I, I do think that we need to remember we don't want to attack the other person, threaten the other person, try to control or manipulate the other person. We want to keep the control where it is absolutely possible, and that is around ourselves. God calls us to be self-controlled. That's one of the evidences of the Spirit of God in us, is that we will remain self-controlled. So we shouldn't control another person, but we do want to hold ourselves together and remain self-controlled. One of the things that I love about this book is its therapy focus because you've been in therapy for a lot of years. Your therapist, Jim, is even featured in this book. You kind of wrote it with him. He has sections at the end of each chapter defining therapy terms. And Joy and I are big fans of therapy, so we were all about this. And I'm just curious, do you think you would have arrived at the same places with the boundaries and even with the goodbyes without that outside perspective? Well, I needed instruction. And I needed someone to help me make the connections. But I know that not everybody is going to go to therapy. I know that 
maybe even if people want to, maybe they haven't found the right therapist or maybe it's too expensive. And so it was really important to me to make this a resource. And for some people, it'll be the affirmation that going to therapy is good. For other people, it may be the only therapy that they get around boundaries. And so that why, that's why it was so important for me to not only have my voice all throughout the book, but to give Jim an opportunity to weave in therapeutic insights as a licensed professional counselor. And I think it just lends some credibility, but also some deeper help for people. And um, yeah, so I would love for everyone to go to therapy. Um, As a matter of fact, I do a podcast with Jim and um, also with my resident theologian at Proverbs 31 Ministries, Dr. Joel Munamale. So we have a podcast called Therapy and Theology. And again, it's our way of getting therapeutic help using also biblical wisdom um, into people's lives so that they can start thinking in a right direction. We always say, we're not going to tell you what to think. We're going to give you a lot to think about. Yeah. And we can't finish this without talking about the real wrap up of the book, which is when a relationship does unfortunately get to that point where a goodbye is necessary. How do you know that? I mean, you've walked this in a unique way. So what advice do you give to people? Well, going back to the access and responsibility, if a relationship gets to the point where the other person is bringing zero responsibility. Continually. Continually. And it's not just a mistake. There's a big difference between a mistake and a pattern. So a mistake is something we all make a pattern is a refusal to address the mistakes so so deeply that there actually is change around it. And so if someone has this pattern of bringing no responsibility over and over and over and over, we can't change that other person and using external pressure. For example, if either one of you had a cardiac event today and and, and you needed assistance, absolutely I would step in, whoever knows CPR would step in, and using external pressure, we would keep your heart beating for the amount of time for other help to get here. But if the other help got here and they started applying external pressure, if your heart doesn't at some point quicken and start to beat on its own, it becomes an unsustainable situation. Never have you seen two friends walking around, one doing chest compressions on the other and thought, wow, that's a healthy dynamic right there, you know? (laughs) Because we cannot, using external force, create permanent change in another person. So if they're bringing a pattern of zero responsibility, the only thing we can control is the access we grant them. And that's going to be your chance to assess. You're going to go to God. You're going to get wise counsel. I always say take steps, not leaps. But at some point, you may need to reduce the access down to zero. This has been so, so good. And I know that you have left Joy and I with so much to think about when it comes to setting boundaries in our own life. And I know that it's going to be so helpful to people who maybe need to consider those goodbyes and what the steps to that looks like. I'm curious if before you go, and this is totally unrelated, but when someone says they're getting a colonoscopy, I always think of you. This was in uh, one of your past books. It's not supposed to be this way about what happened when you had a colonoscopy. And I was hoping that you could share that story with us today. So um, I will give you a little caveat that the doctor that is in this story um, came into my hospital room the day after the colonoscopy. And he told me never ever in his history of doing many colonoscopies has he ever seen this happen. Okay. (laughs) You so, don't want to hear that. <laughs> no. And I was like, great, I'm going to be the butt end of his joke at every, you know, gastrointestinal <laughs> gathering or Christmas party. You know, he's going to be like, remember the time I had that patient? That's me. Okay. So basically, I, I went in to have the colonoscopy. And I have a weird relationship with anesthesia. So many times in dental procedures, I've just woken up in the middle. But I certainly didn't think that that would happen in a colonoscopy, but it did. Now, I have no memory of waking up, but in the middle of the colonoscopy, um, and for those of you who don't know what it is, um, it's where, you know, if they're doing, um, 
if they need to look from your mouth down, you put a tube in your mouth, but if they need to look from the bottom up, they're putting a tube somewhere else, okay? Wow. So that's just the easiest way I can describe it. Wow. And necessary for everyone to get one eventually, especially if you have family history. Thank you. <laughs> Little PSA there. Yeah. Yes, I do highly recommend them. Yeah. Um, and this will not happen to you, so I don't want to deter <laughs> anyone from getting this. However, um, I guess I kind of woke up in the middle of the procedure and I sat straight up, which of course shocked everyone in the room. And I jumped off the table. I picked up the tube, threw it around my shoulder as if it were my purse. (laughs) And I said, I'm sorry, I've had enough of this. You are hurting me and I'm leaving now. And... (laughs) And that's something that I think so many people love about your books is that you have these firm biblical truths, these wisdoms that all of us need, but these anecdotes about jumping off the table during a colonoscopy or accidentally using poop spray as a cologne, that's in this book, that just kind of sprinkles in it and and makes it feel like we're not the only ones who maybe are a little bit of a mess sometimes. So Good Boundaries and Goodbyes is a brand new book from Lisa Turkhurst. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for listening. If you got something out of this episode, we would love if you would share it with a friend. To be notified every time there's a new episode, simply text the word MESS, M-E-S-S, to 91979. And if you have anything you want to share with us, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at holymess at wayfm.com. Thanks for being a part of our messy family.